bolag i Lundinsvärlden idag är det Lokal Diamond och vi har ju varit här många gånger tidigare så jag känner igen många av er. Jag heter Robert Eriksson och jobbar med investerare och mediekontakter för ett antal av bolagen i Lundinsvärlden och bland annat Lukara. Så att jag tänkte inte säga så mycket mer utan jag lämnar över till Lukaras vd, William Mell. Thank you, Robert. Um, I, I just go when he says, I don't have a clue what he's saying. So just before I start, I'd just like to introduce Glenn Pondo, he's our CFO. And, uh, there you go. So if you have any really technical financial questions, that's why Glenn's here. Um, so just before we start, um, this is the Lucara presentation, it's not the Leg Mason Thanksgiving dinner around the corner. Um, and I thought I'd start with that, because Thanksgiving is actually from a diamond perspective, a very, very important part of our year. And I was chatting to people the other day and um, they were saying that 35% of all diamond jewelry sold through the year is sold between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, so um, we should go across there and say thank you for supporting our industry. Um, so a normal cautionary statement. Um, I'm going to start off with, and I think a lot of you will be aware of exactly what our guidance is. This is where we started, um, or this is what we said we were going to do. Um, actually, at the beginning of the year, we said we were going to do something slightly different. Um, and the number there that is different is the, the, the original forecast. So when we started out um, at the beginning of the year, we had, based on our revenue, which we produced last year, $180 million, we said we were going to sell between $150, $160 uh, million worth of diamonds. And, um, a lot of people did, did question why it was lower than the 180, um, but when you're looking for 100 carat stones, trying to predict firstly when you recover a 100 carat stone, um, and, when you and further um, to that, when you recover a gem quality 100 carat stone, is not really um, something that anybody's going to be able to do. So we started out with a revenue forecast slightly lower, um, but in uh, mid-year we did increase that to 240 to 250, and I'll, I'll get on to exactly um, when I talk about the resource, why we did that. Um, in a little bit. So we're looking at recovering 400, 420,000 carats. That's going to be consistent for the next 12, 13 years. Um, operating costs, um, 31 to 33 dollars per ton. We are currently trending slightly below that. Um, and, and again, operating costs are one of the things that we actually have control over. Um, we can sort of adjust things and make sure that, um, yes, we, we, we're, we're never too sure what people are going to be willing to pay for our diamonds, but at least those areas which we can control, such as costs, um, we want to try and minimize those. Um, then we had our, we've got our capital program, and I'll, I'll touch on that, I've got some pictures for you there, um, which is it's actually going very well. We, we do are on schedule to have that completed in the second quarter of next year. And then we're looking at um, our, our um, resource update, which really, I can sort of take that point off. Um, everybody would have read that, but it's kind of old news now, especially when we look at what the mine has produced and what we've recovered um, through the year. We've got Matai, um, our exploration project, um, which we're still looking at options there, and I can touch on that later. And then more excitingly, the two prospecting licenses, which we picked up. And this is now sort of upside. And I've got a couple of slides where I'll talk about that. Um, the only really important thing here is um, we have a lot of cash. And later on, I've got a, a sort of a, a Q3 uh, report, which actually shows you just sort of how the cash has been generated. I um, mean, there's a number of things there which we will we'll point out. And it's really sort of over and above what we're actually spending, the money which we're spending on the, the capital program, um, the dividend which we're paying out, um, and where we're actually trending in terms of, of that overall number. And then sort of, I'm assuming that you wouldn't be here if you didn't hold Lucara shares. Um, so it's also the, the, the dividend. Um, and I mentioned last time I was here, um, which was in May, that we were looking to pay a dividend. And since then, you've hopefully already gotten your dividend check and you're looking forward to another one, um, which will be posted on the 18th of December. And for a Lundin Group company, or being the first Lundin Group company to actually pay a dividend. Um, we want to make sure that sort of people are happy. I'm sure that everybody would want more of a dividend. Um, but again, we looked at this from a, an overall sustainability perspective. We want to make sure that when we start paying a dividend, for the next 12 years, we can continue to do that with a special dividend, which is sort of, I guess, the Christmas gift on the top. <laughs> so what I normally don't do is I normally don't talk about the diamond market. So what actually excites us at Dukara about what the future looks like? Um, so the, the next four slides, I'm just going to run through the sort of basics of what makes the diamond industry sort of appealing for, for investors and actually mining companies like ourselves. So the, the curve or the, the graph that you see above there is the last 10 years worth of production data. 
It's information sort of which we can take directly off of the Kimberley Process um, website. And it shows sort of by country um, where the diamonds are coming from. But the more important numbers, and I don't have a laser pointer, so um, I'll just point out, is the, the little numbers on the top there. That's the total carrot volume in millions of carrots produced per year. And you can see in 2005, 2006 was at a maximum, 176 million carrots, dropping to 168 and then sort of slowing down until 2009. Nobody really wants to talk about that, but a lot of the mines actually put their, their operations on care and maintenance um, while they waited for, for the market to come back. But more importantly, if you look at the last five years, um, where the mines have now cranked up again, they, they, they're running at full steam, the volume that they achieved in 19 or 2004, 2005, uh, they're not even close to that. In most aspects, they're about 40, um, 40 to 45 million carats less than the highs achieved. And a lot of people say, well, why is that different? Why can the mines not actually get back up to where they were um, in 2004, 2005? And there's a number of reasons. Argyle is one of them. Um, the big Australian diamond mine um, owned by Rio Tinto, when they first started, they were sort of pumping out up to 35 million carats a year. And 35 million carats, it's a, it's a fairly large pile, but it's, they, they, their diamonds like beach sand. Very, very small diamonds. But they have now transitioned from open cast to fully underground. They've spent a billion dollars, only about $300 million overspent on the underground development. But as soon as you go underground, um, production is normally halved and costs go up. So the, you, you, as much as what you would want to extract more material from an underground mine, it generally doesn't happen that way. Um, so from the 35 million carats that Argyle was producing, um, they're now down to about, on average, between 10 and 12 million carats a year. So automatically there, you've got 20, 23 million carats out of the mix. If you look at the Russian mines, a lot of those mines have now gotten to the economic limit of the open pit. They're now going underground as well. Even some of the De Beers mines, which have now been sold off, um, Cullinan is another one. Um, De Beers sold it off because it actually just couldn't get the diamonds out that they wanted. So there are a number of factors which actually play into the world's mines not being able to, to deliver the same volume as what they did. So what we've got here is um, a, a slowdown in what the mines actually provide into the, the market. If we take that further and we say, well, from an exploration perspective, from a project perspective, what operations or projects are out there which over the, the short to medium term will actually be going into production and starting to produce? And the, the, the Bain and Company, they actually put this together and it talks to a maximum. So if we look at the, 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 the total number there, a maximum of between 18 and 20 million carats that new projects could actually produce. So we've got 130, which is, which is currently being produced, maybe 20 million carats, which can be produced. So we're still not getting anywhere close to the, 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 the maximum supply which the market has seen. But if we break this down further, um, so GRIB, this is the, most, most probably the biggest undeveloped, well, it's not being developed, it's actually they, they had their first sale about two weeks ago. So it used to be the biggest undeveloped um, Kimberlites. It's owned by Luke Oil. Luke Oil, not very well known for, for running diamond mines, and apparently they are looking to sell it. Um, but they've only just gone into production. So if you look at the, the way it starts over here, they are already about two years behind what they said they were going to do. Um, all the other projects, um, that's uh, the, the, the Dikamon project in the Sutu, um, they're expecting to be in production way over here, 2016. So they're four years behind. So these are projects which I'm positive will actually go in. Um, you've got Gachukwe, they're also looking at production 2016, and Renard. So those three projects, the, the yellow, the blue, and the, the orange, are funded. So they're actually busy with the process there. The rest of them, I uh, wouldn't put a lot of sort of money into them going ahead. Um, the second one down, the, if you can read it there, it says the Star Orion. Um, it's never going to be bought. And it's a fairly large volume that they're supposed to be producing there. But they're looking at a three and a half billion dollar initial capital spend. Um, it's just one of those projects where even though it has diamonds, it's never going to be economic to put it into production. And the top one, the Bunda um, Kimberlite in, in India, owned by Rio Tinto, um, if they can actually get the permits and sort of bypass the corruption, they may actually put that into production. And they're targeting 2019 as a production forecast. The rest of the little ones there, Lace, um, which has a check mark on the bottom there, um, they are busy sort of developing that, but the little bar is so small, it's not really going to make that much difference. So what we've got is constrained supply, around about 130 million carats, and very small amounts of additional supply. So if you total up the, the, those curves, and the green one actually makes up quite a bit, you're looking at maybe 10 million carats. So if we're lucky, we'll see 140 
really lucky, 145 million carats. If we then look at how much money has actually been spent on exploration, and I would have mentioned in, in previous presentations, the probability of finding a kimberlite that has economic quantities of diamonds, and when I say economic, something that will actually justify spending a good couple of hundred million dollars to build a plot, is one in a thousand. So people, especially in the, the, the way the resource sector is at the moment, it's very difficult to actually find investors who are going to put money in when your strike rate is one in a thousand. And diamond exploration is it's not the most cost or sort of inexpensive process. Um, diamond exploration is actually pretty expensive. Um, De Beers spent almost $50 million exploring the Kimberlite, which we are now exploiting. So to get that type of money, hoping to find something, um, risk profile is a little bit higher there. So if we look at the amount of money being spent on exploration, exceptionally low. Even De Beers has cut back their budget to most already about 5% of what it used to be about 10 years ago. Moving forward, well, where are these diamonds going? And we've already mentioned Thanksgiving, so that part of the presentation I'll skip. But the US is still the largest consumer of diamond jewelry. Um, after the, the, prior to sort of 2008, the US was consuming about 55% of global diamond jewelry. That's now sitting at most sorry, between 42 and 45%. Um, if you go, there's, there's a really good website where you can actually pull up historical data on um, consumer confidence for the US. And consumer confidence in the US is currently sitting at about an eight year high significantly higher than where it was prior to 2008. So that's why I joke about the Thanksgiving, but it's actually a very important time for us because it'll set the benchmark for where rough diamond prices are gonna go early in um, the first quarter of next year. But more interestingly there is India and China. So a little bit of story, and I've most probably told this, so put up your hand if you've heard it more than once. Um, in sort of about 1984, um, De Beers looked at the global market and they looked at Japan. Um, a growing economy, sort of really moving quickly, a nice large population, um, but diamond consumption, almost so low you'd have to dig for it. So they took the marketing machine, which is De Beers, and De Beers is actually more of a marketing company than what it is a diamond mining company. And they went into Japan and they started to change the way people thought about diamonds. Okay. Okay. Got where it was. Um, <laughs> so De Beers goes into Japan and they, they, they now start to institutionalize the buying of diamonds, and specifically the buying of diamonds as a precursor to a wedding. And over the next sort of five or eight years, um, Japan actually grows. They grow so quickly that they actually then sit second behind the US in the consumption of diamond jewelry. And they didn't get anywhere close to the US. The US was sitting at about 60, 65% at that point. But China actually grew to up to 15% of global diamond consumption, or sorry, Japan grew up to 15% of global diamond consumption. And not enough, they still sit at around about 12%. So, Time goes by, and in sort of the, the late 90s, De Beers does the same. They're going, where is the next moving economy? And they look to China, sort of five, six times the population of Japan, a growing middle class, sort of the same exact fundamentals as what they saw in, in Japan sort of two decades before. And they took their marketing machine and off they went to China. And within five years, China overtook Japan. So the, obviously, it's great to see sort of the, the marketing machine which, which De Beers uses working again. Um, and Japan um, now sits third behind China in terms of global diamond consumption. Um, I am, however, a lot more bullish about India. Um, the Indians actually understand the value, not just of gold, but of jewelry. Um, and we, but there's actually a, a specific wedding season, a sort of six weeks where um, India will have anywhere between 10 and 12 million 